In the 1800s, medical research and training was expanding rapidly. With this increased understanding of the human body and the growing interest in further developing the medical field came the need for bodies. Lots and lots of bodies. More specifically, dead bodies. Hey y'all, I'm Christina and you're listening to History and Hearsay. Welcome back to my spooky season series. Last week we talked all about the history of medical practices that led us to this point. So after you watch this video, check that video out here. And before you go, make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss the next two videos that are gonna be in this series. The 1800s gave us many advancements in medical discoveries. In 1816, the stethoscope was invented. And while blood transfusions from animals had been seen as early as the 1600s, it wasn't until 1818 that the first successful human-to-human -human blood transfusion was recorded. In 1829, aspirin was discovered, and in 1867, someone came up with the antiseptics theory and decided that it might be a good idea if we started washing our hands and our medical tools before performing surgeries. So as you can imagine, that one saved many lives. Medical research and training was expanding rapidly, and along with this increased understanding of the human body and the growing interest interest of further development for the medical field came the aforementioned need for lots of dead bodies to practice on. So how did medical students get these dead bodies, aka cadavers, in which to practice on? Well, in 1800s in both the United States and the UK, it was pretty common that the punishment for criminal activity was execution. And once executed, these criminals' bodies would then be donated for medical research and dissection. Now, during this time, many people believed that in order to get to heaven, your physical body had to be intact. So because of this belief, having your body dissected was an extreme form of punishment. You didn't have people just volunteering their bodies to science like you see nowadays. Back then, this was considered a terrible thing to have happen to you. Okay, so the only available bodies were those of criminals. And while you might think that people were being executed left and right back in those days, the demand for bodies far outweighed the supply. In Baltimore, when John Hopkins Medical School first opened, there were 1,200 medical students having to share only 49 legally obtained bodies. And in the UK, medical schools were in a similar situation. While hundreds of people were being put to death over petty crimes in the 18th century, by the 19th century, the laws had luckily matured to the point that capital punishment was reserved for the most severe crimes, and therefore this meant that the average people being executed fell to only about 55 people per year. And while this was great for petty thieves, this meant that the medical schools, who now needed about 500 bodies per year, had a very large deficit to make up for. So what was the solution? Well, Medical students in both the US and the UK decided that they had to find a way to obtain these bodies, legal or not. And so they started stealing freshly buried bodies from cemeteries. Now, before we go any further, I do need to make a quick distinction between grave robbing and body snatching. While grave robbing is when a grave was dug up to steal all the valuables that might have been buried with them, body snatching were where the graves were dug up with the sole purpose of stealing the actual body that was buried there, body snatchers would not steal any of the deceased's belongings. They often even left behind the deceased's clothing because with the way the laws were written, if they were caught and prosecuted, it was actually easier to get away with stealing a dead body than it was to get away with stealing the clothes that were on that body because the clothing was seen as having an owner from which it was stolen from, whereas the dead body was kind of a finder's keeper's gray situation since the body had been vacated by the previous owner. While in Central Europe, the authorities solved their body problem by distributing unclaimed corpses to medical schools. So, you know, if there was like someone who didn't have any family, no one came to claim their body, that would be given to the medical schools. But this had not yet caught on in the United States, England, or Scotland. And so medical schools needing dissection material acquired corpses the best way they could by sending out janitors, students, the medical doctors who were the professors of the school, anyone involved with the school to rob fresh graves. While 
technically stealing a body was a misdemeanor, it was seldom prosecuted. Politicians protected it in the name of the common good and the police, they kind of just looked the other way unless someone forced them to take action. Lawyers were the ones arguing the point that the occupant of the body had vacated it and so ownership was in question. So there was no victim here. So there wasn't really anyone to even sue unless the cemetery tried to sue, but this rarely happened because it's believed that the cemeteries themselves were often in cahoots with the body snatchers. While this practice really ramped up in the 1800s because of the increase in medical schools and therefore students, body snatching had already been an issue for many years prior to this. In New York in 1788, there was a case of a woman's body that had been stolen for a dissection. And once the story came out, people rioted against New York doctors and several people lost their lives. While, as I mentioned earlier, many government officials turned a blind eye to the business of body snatching, seeing it as a necessary evil. Basically, they had no solutions to offer the medical schools, so they kind of just accepted the ones that they came up with on their own. But the general population did not accept this. No one was okay with their family member's body being taken and desecrated in this way, especially because of the implications that many of them believed it had on the afterlife. So these medical students knew that if they were going to obtain illegal bodies, they had to do their very best to keep it all a secret. And as I mentioned earlier in the beginning, the medical students, their teachers, even the janitors would go out at night and snatch a body from their grave. Over time, medical students realized that there was an easier way to obtain bodies than to physically go out and dig them up themselves. They could simply offer to pay for dead bodies and people were willing to deliver them directly to the school. The going rate that a school was willing to pay for one dead body was equivalent to two months wages for a lot of these people. And so with such a low risk of only being like a slap on the wrist misdemeanor and such a high reward. As you can imagine, there were quite a few takers and this is how the resurrectionists were born. This term was mainly used in the UK, but the resurrectionists or resurrection men were professional body snatchers who took bodies with the sole purpose of selling them to the medical community for dissection. So it ended up being that these medical professionals essentially had a budget for dead bodies and the resurrectionists delivered. These professional body snatchers became quite skilled at ways of retrieving dead bodies. And it said that they could snatch a dead body in as little as 15 minutes minutes. Now these guys did not dig up entire coffins like you'll often to see depicted in movies. Instead, they began by shoveling at the head of the freshly buried coffin. They would break the lid off the coffin and then they would place a hook down in the hole and snag either around the deceased neck or armpit. And with the help of a rope, they would ease the body out of the grave. They would then throw any clothing or belongings back into the hole before doing their best to cover the grave up and make it appear as though it was undisturbed. Body snatching became such a problem that those who could afford it started retrofitting their loved one's graves to prevent these bodies from being stolen. Cages were put on top of graves and they would even fill the graves with heavy stones to make the coffin harder to pull up. And the very wealthy would even hire guards to look after the body until it had been buried long enough that it was no longer fresh enough that the body snatchers would want it. And of course, body snatchers were looking for the easiest bodies to grab without being caught. And so this meant that it was most mostly the poor who became the victims of body snatching as the poor were typically buried on the edge of town. Their families couldn't afford the elaborate deterrents used by the wealthy. And they were often even buried in a potter's field, which were multiple bodies that were buried in one long trench. It wasn't even dug that deep. And these graves were very crude because of how hastily they were dug, I guess to save money or whatever. And so when they covered the bodies up that were buried there, they didn't even really cover them up very deep. And so when someone would steal a body from a potter's field, they were very easy to cover back up in haste and make them appear as though had never even been tampered with. Some of these resurrectionists would even scout uh, things out ahead of time by sending women to the funerals and have them pretend to be mourners just to kind of make sure that the recently buried bodies didn't have any kind of booby traps. Like they weren't one that had any of these protections around their graves. And so in this way, they were able to kind of scout out the best, easiest bodies to go and snatch. In the United States, Baltimore 
Baltimore, Maryland quickly became a major hub for resurrectionists. Because there were about a half dozen medical schools in the city, all needing a steady supply of corpses, and it was also a major plus that Baltimore was located in a temperate zone that allowed for digging in winter when the ground in New England and the majority of the rest of the Midwest was frozen solid. There were also the newly installed railroads in that area that made it very easy for resurrections to ship the body and therefore they were able to supply surrounding areas with all the corpses their little hearts could desire. Now, when it came to shipping these bodies on the trains, the resurrectionists would simply stuff the corpse into barrels and place them on the trains. You might be thinking, wouldn't that smell like, wouldn't someone discover that? Well, they had a solution for this. They actually were using barrels that were filled with whiskey, which helped to mask the odor. And so once the barrels arrived at their destination, a medical school would retrieve the remains for dissection. And as for the whiskey, it was sold to patrons as an extra stiff drink. As I mentioned earlier, the victims of these crimes were mostly the poor, but the rich and the famous were not completely immune to body snatching either. In 1878, Congressman John Scott Harrison, who was the son of former President William Henry Harrison, died and his family buried him in a large vault and covered it in large rocks. Even with these precautions, the same day he was buried, it was discovered that his body had already been snatched. And it didn't take long for investigators to discover his body hanging on a hook at the Ohio Medical College in Cincinnati. Now, while we can sit here and debate the morality behind stealing bodies and then dissecting them for medical research, some people certainly took things just a bit too far. In Scotland, there was a body snatcher by the name of Edward Burke who apparently got either too impatient or just too greedy because he stopped waiting for people to die and instead he started killing people with the sole purpose of selling their bodies to science. He murdered and sold the bodies of 16 people before authorities caught it to him. This case was so famous that they dubbed this heinous act burking when others began to copy the style of killing for profit. Now, I may do an entire video just on this case, so stay tuned for that one. Luckily, this trend of burking did not catch on in the United States, and we only have one documented case of a trial for burking in the U.S., which was in 1886 when a 28-year-old man named John T. Ross hit a woman over the head with a brick, killing her. She was a 60-year-old woman named Ellen Brown, and she was a boarder at John's mother's rent house. After killing her, John sold Ellen's body for $15. John Ross was caught and hanged for his crimes, and his body was then given to science for dissection. Poetic justice. Over the years, the combination of body snatchings, murders, and resurrectionist riots led to the enactment of the anatomy law in Britain in 1832 and the years following the United States passed similar acts as well. As the government began to recognize the need for bodies for medical education and research, these acts were amended and refined over the years in an attempt to come up with solutions to help control body snatching by making more bodies available to the medical community. In 1831, after the body snatching incident of John Scott Harrison, a number of states passed similar laws outlawing body snatching and giving unclaimed bodies to science. By the early 1900s, most states had passed similar laws. Apparently, there were so many unclaimed bodies that this severely lowered the need for body snatching. And while these laws did help a bit because they allowed for more bodies to become available, it was really embalming, which came into to regular use in the 1880s that allowed medical schools to keep bodies for months on end that really put an end to body snatching. It wasn't until 1968 that the Uniformed Anatomy Gift Act was passed on a federal level. This kind of got rid of the patchwork of legislation across all the different states where they all had different rules, and it allowed for donors to bequeath their bodies to medical study. This new trend saw dissection not as a punishment or desecration, but as a charitable act. Believe it or not, body snatching still happens today all over the world. Over the past 20 years in the U.S. alone, more than 16,800 families have put forward lawsuits claiming that the body parts of their loved ones were harvested and sold for profit. 
In China, there's been many reports of female corpses that were stolen to be used as brides for traditional Chinese ghost marriages, which these occur when a single man dies before marriage. The female corpse is buried with him, acting kind of as a surrogate bride. Though we don't hear about it too often, body snatching remains a grim and lucrative trade. So what do you guys think? I'm sure most of you have heard of body snatching before, but I'm curious if you learned anything new. I know I definitely did when I was researching this. So let me know in the comments down below if there was anything new that you learned today. Don't forget to come back for my next spooky season episode. I'll see you guys right here next week.